So welcome everybody to today's uh, interview in the frame of our CSAZ talks. Um, we are speaking with, I'd say, very interesting people also in view of the upcoming uh, 2024 European elections and many developments have taken place. And today I'm with Paul Nemitz, he's a principal advisor on justice policy at the EU Commission. He's a member of German Data, Data Ethics Commission Global Council on Extended Intelligent Intelligence. He's visiting professor of law at the College of Europe and chair of the Arthur Langemann Foundation. So I would say he's he's the, the Brussels guru, if I may say so, Paul, for uh, new technologies and data and their legal, societal and ethical implications. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. Paul, um, I was, of course, looking around a little bit before our interview and I came across one of the sentences or one of the books of Yuval Noah Harari, uh, Lessons for the 21st Century. And he writes in there that due to the interconnection between artificial intelligence, um, big data, biotechnology, um, algorithms are more and more influencing our thinking, our uh, acting and our emotions. How can artificial intelligence, if you see it from the other side, uh, contribute to the strengthening of democracy? Because uh, Harari comes to the conclusion that democracy can be under threat. Please. Well, I mean, first of all, I think we have to take uh, the discussion about the challenges to democracy and fundamental rights and to an orderly discourse in the public sphere by um, artificial intelligence systems, whether they serve targeted advertisement, whether they produce text now like GPT-3 and GPT-4 soon, um, we have to take this serious. But it is true that we have to try uh, to use uh, these technologies um, also for democracy and for fundamental rights, but we cannot do it without the technological intelligentsia and without the big corporates who bring this technology forward helping us with this. I can, of course, imagine that uh, to support the rule of law, uh, for example, um, in the area of data protection, that artificial intelligence is used to check on companies whether they comply with a data protection law or in the area of competition law, artificial intelligence may observe market developments. And if there's a lot of parallelity in behavior of pricing uh, of companies, then artificial intelligence may give a hint um, uh, to the um, enforcement authorities and they then may gather further evidence to see whether there is illegal collusion. Same is true for insider trading. So. Um, I think uh, there is great potential uh, in, this, um, in these systems. But what we see so far is, for example, if we come back to the area of law enforcement, artificial intelligence is developed by the market to go after individuals, after people. Um, for example, for predictive policing um, or the system Compass in the United States for parole. And why is that so? Because the market of police services and the market of uh, criminal uh, law relating to people is huge. And uh, police services all over the world need um, uh, support to become more efficient. So that's an area where money is to be made. And that's where we see artificial intelligence being used for repressive purposes. But when it comes to uh, policing companies, well, you know, we have one uh, big uh, competition authority in Europe, that's the European Commission. Every member state also has a competition authority, but they're much smaller. Same for data protection. So, you know, this is much less than the big police force, which goes after individuals, and this market is much smaller. So we do not see a lot of private initiative to develop these technologies, for example, for law enforcement against corporations, which then serve these regulators. And so I would think one way, and not exclusively and not the only way, but one way is certainly that we need, um, on the one hand, to hold the big corporations, which make billions of euros profits with these systems to account. And uh, they, I think, should engage also in the public interest. 
and support the development of um, public interest artificial intelligence. And I think we also need um, to reorient uh, some of public investment from public funds. Um, the old thinking that the infrastructure consists only of hardware, I think is outdated. These softwares are the infrastructure of the future. Do you think the big corporates are ready for that? Or what is what are the main obstacles? Well, I think uh, um, some of the big corporates understand that they have uh, a, a duty to uh, democracy and to the rule of law. Um, I think it's uh, um, quite astonishing how in business schools and also in Silicon Valley, there were 20 years of uh, a doctrine of disruptive innovation which included the disruption of the law, meaning the simple non-obedience to the law as a normal business practice. I think this has changed a little bit. Uh, even Mark Zuckerberg, uh, in an interview already two years ago in March in the Washington Post, called for laws. And I think um, we are seeing a renaissance of the law and an understanding also of the big corporate that they actually need a stable legal environment. And if that is so, one uh, must um, ask them to support democratic processes and not to undermine them in their lobbying, for example, but also to calibrate technology in such a way that it is um, useful for democracy and fundamental rights delivery and not the country. So I think I see uh, in some of the companies a certain willingness to go in this direction. But as I said, I think we also need public funds for this purpose. It is said uh, we need to, or they need to calibrate technology. We are trade union in a confederation. It, what risks do you see, generally speaking, when you speak of AI uh, for citizens, but also in particular for workers? Um, are there possibilities which workers should increasingly use to contribute to calibrating this technology uh, so that I would say the certain decisions which are made um, also are beneficial to workers. There are many aspects in which these technology touch on workers' rights and citizens' rights. I would say, first of all, um, in relation to the state the automating decision-making, which uh, um, concerns citizens, there must be a very clear principle that there must be a specific legal base which authorizes such uh, use of AI. So before a state moves forward and automates decision-making, which touches on rights of people, in particular fundamental rights, um, it must be the democratic process, it must be the legislator, who has decided consciously that uh, this certain area should be automized with AI. I think this is very important not to lose um, a control of the legality of um, and the, the orientation towards uh, democratic action um, of the administration. As to workers' rights, um, I think there is a basic principle in the constitutions of the Western world um, inspired by humanism, which is that human beings shall not become objects of machines. And they shall certainly not become object of machine decisions. And this very general principle, which emanates from um, the dignity of uh, mankind, um, is um, already enshrined to some extent in the data protection regulation, which gives the right to individuals to object to automated processing of personal data. But I would say beyond this, um, the general principle that human beings shall not be objects of machine must also find its expression in labor law. And there must be limitations to algorithmic uh, management. Um, um, for example, I think it is inconceivable um, that workers uh, who work in a uh, factory or work in logistics have on their belt a movement detector, and if they don't move enough, uh, they are automatically fired, as it supposedly happened in Amazon warehouses in the US uh, uh, in the past. 
this type of algorithmic management and also um, other types of algorithmic management, uh, I think, are already today illegal uh, in Europe. And we have to be very strong and very clear in uh, maintaining the rules of labor law and the rules in particular of workers' consultation and the shop steward involvement in uh, bringing any algorithmic systems uh, uh, to the workplace. Um, Paul, you were the lead director for the reform of the EU um, data protection legislation. Now we look back at um, 2018 when the um, GDPR um, uh, came into force. What, what has happened so far? Are you satisfied with the developments? I remember that it was it was a big, how could I say, big confusion, big outcry at the beginning, and things have settled down. Have your expectations been met? Yes, uh, my expectations have been met to a large extent, although I think uh, the data protection authorities, in particular the Irish data protection authorities, uh, uh, authority can do a better job. But we are seeing a clear upward trend in the number of enforcement decisions, um, which are also imposing fines and which are contentious, meaning uh, that these are enforcement decisions which, uh, to which the, the companies on which the decision is taken do not necessarily agree. And this is very, very important that we move out of the old gentlemen and gentlewomen's culture which existed before the regulation under the directive where one had a coffee together and you know one always agreed and nothing was contentious, which meant really that the law was not properly enforced. So um, I think it's good that data protection authorities increasingly take rigorous decisions on data protection. This is a key piece of law which concerns every citizen because personal data of people are used in many, many contexts. And it is very, very important that it is properly enforced. And I see a good trend of increasing activism of data protection authorities. And I think also in the dialogue between data protection authorities, the Irish authority has understood that it is destroying the one-stop shop if it doesn't do its job as a European authority. That's very important that the data protection authorities all in all member states understand their job is to protect all Europeans. They are not authorities which act in a national interest, for example, in the case of Ireland, to maximize investment of American uh, corporations in Ireland. That's not the job of the data protection authority. The Irish data protection authority protects all citizens in Europe in relation to the behavior of companies which have a headquarter in uh, Ireland, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, and so on. And they have to exercise this job as an European authority. That is very important. And I think this culture needs time. And let's say it this way. No law is perfectly enforced. Tax law is not perfectly enforced. Even murder, uh, 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 criminal law, uh, which says, you know, you go to prison for 30 years. Uh, if you kill someone, you know, we have murders every day. So let's not put the bar too high. But I think... Uh, we must continue insisting that the data protection authorities enforce this law rigorously. And the good news is also that under the new regulation, we see a lot of actions of civil society and individuals against data protection authorities who don't do their job properly. And the courts have already ruled on quite such number of cases. This is the balance which we need in any future law on the digital, um, namely that the enforcers know that they cannot evade uh, lit litigation by simply doing nothing. I think this time must end. And uh, so I think there we were quite successful in the GDPR to open the door also on a systemic pressure of citizens and civil society on uh, the data protection authorities to do their job. Last word, we will propose um, a procedural regulation which facilitates the cooperation and, uh, between data protection authorities across borders, which makes this cooperation 
clearer in terms of time deadlines because this cooperation is just too slow and too inefficient. I would say there's a lack of goodwill among some, and so we need further uh, written laws. I would have hoped this would not have been necessary, but okay, we will now propose procedural laws, and we have to watch very carefully who tries to undermine the effectiveness of these laws once the proposal is on the table. Paul, a final word maybe um, from you as, as, a, as I said, the, the, the guru of, of uh, data and um, uh, new technologies. What, how can we make sure, what will be decisive for you now in the coming years? Which actors will be decisive when it comes to control both data and automated uh, decision making. What do you think are the real crucial elements where legislators, social partners, civil society groups or big companies have to step in? Yes, I think um, the most up-to-date issue is of course now the automated production of texts. Uh, we're all fascinated by GPT-3. And so I think uh, we need very clear rules which have to be rigorously enforced that at all times humans know whether they um, communicate with a machine or with another human being. This is key for human dignity. It's, it's not uh, conceivable that we are misled about who we are talking to, whether it's a human or a machine. And of course, democracy doesn't work if it's not clear whether it's a subject to subject conversation or whether there's a machine on the other side making you know maybe political arguments and convincing me of this or that good candidate so um, there we have to be very clear in terms of the actors i think those who build the technology have a very high responsibility to comply with the law and to be in the center of the law and also in the lawmaking process not to try to undermine the effectiveness of the law but on the contrary to contribute to good rules which create a level playing field for future um, technology development in line with the needs of democracy and fundamental rights and the rule of law. And the last point is, I think unions and civil society organizing citizens' interest will be key. I believe data protection will be the key issue also in relation to artificial intelligence, because whenever artificial intelligence processes personal data at the workplace, for example, the data protection rules will be in question. And I think it is very, very important that union shop stewards and union legal advisors get top fit on data protection issues so that they can take a combined view informed by labor law and data protection law um, to um, defend the interests of workers uh, in the workplace when it comes to the use of their personal data, including through algorithms and AI. Paul, we take that with us. Thanks a lot. Um, well, all the best to you and to your work and hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.